Welcome to the FaithBridge Sermon Podcast. Be sure to keep watching immediately after the sermon for Postscript, a weekly podcast with in-depth content and answers to your questions submitted during the sermon. You can also find it on iTunes or at faithbridge.org slash postscript. Welcome. So glad that you are here. If you're in Cinecourt East, if you're in Cinecourt West, if you're at the Woodlands campus today, if you're online uh, somewhere near or far, we're glad that you're worshiping here. Hope you can just feel uh, right at home. So I'm excited about our preacher of the day, Timothy T.A. Atik, um, known finally as T.A. So he's not new to FaithBridge. Uh, I looked back, as a matter of fact, he preached his first time here five years ago in 2011. And we have enjoyed his preaching over the years and will continue to. And uh, so he doesn't need really much introduction. But his introduction needs a little tweaking uh, because a lot has happened in the last month. Now, you know, from last week at the end of the service when I explained all the good things that God's been doing in uh, Ben and Donna Stewart's life and how they have felt God's call from the invitation that Louis Giglio uh, uh, issued to them uh, recently to move to Atlanta, Georgia and partner with him at the Passion City Church and eventually launch out from there and start a church. And we talked about how, don't, don't fret, he's still going to be able to preach here, at least in the short run, uh, at Faith Bridge, and we're excited about that. But that raised the big question, so who's going to take over the vibrant breakaway ministry at uh, Texas A&M on Tuesday nights. I mean, you got thousands of students there in Reed Arena, and, and who's the person? Well, a good while back, Ben said to the board, which I'm on, uh, he said, it's, it's really one person, I think. I think it's Timothy Atik, T.A. Well, several of us knew him and said, yeah, that makes total sense. That's a no-brainer. That'll be great. And, uh, but a few on the board didn't know him. And so uh, he was scheduled to preach at Breakaway three or four weeks ago. And unbeknownst to TA, there was a lot of eyes watching in, either live or on live at the live streaming um, from the board that night. And there was a lot of texting that was going on. And at one point in the message, he was just preaching a great message and just, just, it was just, Working and it was, I could just feel it just even 60 miles away. The Lord was using it in my life. Towards the end of the message, um, he said, Well, I'll go ahead and tell you, college students, this because I may never see you again, anyhow. And somebody texted in our little group uh, link, Oh, yes, you will. And so the announcement was made this past Tuesday night that TA will become the next director of Breakaway Ministry. So, yeah, that's very exciting. And because we've loved Breakaway for years and years. And uh, so this is a wonderful thing. Let's welcome T.A. as he comes to bring God's word to us now. Well, good morning, Faith Bridge. How are we doing today? It is uh, such a privilege an honor to be back with you. I, um, I just love the opportunity to be here at FaithBridge. So thanks for having me today. I want to say this. Uh, my wife and I, we got married about nine and a half years ago, which uh, means we started dating about ten and a half years ago, which means I started trying to work it with her about eleven and a half years ago. And I'm going to say something right now which will shock every person in this room, but believe it or not, there was actually a time when my wife just wasn't that into this. I know. Hey, I know. Just as shocked as you are. But, um, you know, I was thinking back on the time before Catherine and I started dating, <clears throat> and I'll never forget this night where I was on the phone talking with Catherine. And uh, somehow I convinced her to watch a movie with me. And it caught me so off guard that I immediately went and started to change my clothes. Because I didn't want to just look fine. Like, I wanted to look like fist-biting fine. Like, mm, wow, all right? 
I know what some of y'all are thinking. You're thinking that's not possible for you. That's what I was going for, all right? And so I am trying to get ready for this evening. And as I'm getting ready, my mind just begins to go down the romantic road. I just begin to think, oh my gosh, this is the Catherine Robison. Like what if this little time watching a movie kind of snowballs into me getting to ask her out on like an official date? And what if we begin dating? And so I'm just beginning to go down the romantic road. And um, so I get ready to go. I check my clothes. They look good. The spike is spiky, and I get in my car, and I am making my way over to meet Catherine, and I'm just fighting off pitters the whole way over there. (laughs) So nervous. And uh, while I'm in the car, I just think, you know what, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to call Catherine and see if I can pick her up some ice cream on the way over just to show her that I can be spontaneous, fun, thoughtful. And so I call up Catherine, ask her if I can get her some ice cream, and she informs me that she doesn't want any ice cream And then she also informs me that her friend Katie is going to be joining us that night. And uh, that kind of began a night-long lesson as a guy that, like, when you initiate with a girl, you really need to be clear on what your intentions are. Because uh, that night I got to Catherine's apartment, and while I was there, a different guy called to actually ask her out. And so Catherine spent the majority of the evening in the other room on the phone with a different, on the phone with a different guy. Um, The the good news is that after she got off the phone, um, us three girls were able to sit and debrief (laughs) about the whole conversation. (laughs) Um, But I tell you that because, man, that night... My dreams in reality went in two totally different directions, all right? Like that night, I dreamt of being Catherine's man, and I ended up being her gal pal, all right? Two totally different directions, and there was disappointment in that, but I would say the disappointment lasted for about a day. But I tell you that because in life, man, there are times in life where our dreams and reality can go in two totally different directions. How we think things are going to go and how things actually go can be so different and it can land us in monumental disappointment. And I wonder if that's anyone here this morning where you're in this place in life where your dreams and reality have gone in two totally different directions and you have landed in a season of disappointment. And you need to know there are times where seasons of disappointment don't just last a day. They can last a week, a month, months, or even years. And I just wonder if that's anyone here today. Maybe your dreams in marriage or parenting in your reality in marriage or parenting have gone in two totally different directions and life is disappointing. Maybe your work is in a really bad spot right now. Maybe the floods have really devastated you in some ways. Maybe you're single and you don't want to be. Maybe um, you've gone through a breakup. Maybe someone you love is sick. Maybe you are sick. Maybe your family planning hasn't gone how you wanted it to go at all. Maybe you're lonely right now. Maybe you can't put your finger on it, but you would just say that over the last few months you haven't felt yourself, and if you're honest, you would say, man, I think I've probably battled some depression, and life has been disappointing. How do you deal with the disappointment that comes when your dreams and your reality go in two totally different directions? Here's what I want to do this morning. I want to, I want to step into Luke chapter 1, and I want to look at the story of Zachariah and Elizabeth and the disappointment that they experienced in their lives. And I want to give you four key truths you need to know if you are going to deal with disappointment. So if you have a Bible, turn with me this morning to Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1 is where we will be today. We'll start in verse 5. Verse 5 is going to kind of introduce us to Zechariah and Elizabeth. It says this. It says, In the days of Herod, king of Judea, There was a priest named Zechariah 
of the division of Abijah, and he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And so here we get some good information about Zechariah and Elizabeth. We find out that Zechariah is a priest, which tells us that he works for God for a living. And as a priest, he would have been required to marry a virgin Israelite. Well, he married Elizabeth. Elizabeth wasn't just any old virgin Israelite. She was a descendant of Aaron. That's what the text tells us. Who was Aaron? Aaron was the first high priest of the nation of Israel, and that was considered a big deal. That means that Zechariah was a poster child for the how did that guy get that girl foundation, all right? So they have it going on. This is a power couple, and then verse 6 tells us a little bit more about them. It says this, and they were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord. So they knew God, they walked with God, and they obeyed God. But then we get to verse 7. And verse 7 is going to drop us into their disappointment. It says, but they had no child. Because Elizabeth was barren, and both were advanced in years. So you have these two amazing people sitting in an extended season of disappointment. Elizabeth is barren. And then it tells us something very important. It says that they are advanced in years. Here's what you need to know. Childlessness in this society was considered a curse. Not only that, a woman's value in society was in large part measured by her ability to have children. Not only that, children were responsible for taking care of their parents as they got older. They were responsible for taking care of them physically and financially. So the fact that we know that they are advanced in years tells us that they have been walking in public shame for years and things were not going to change. Because Elizabeth was beyond the years of having children. So that meant that most likely they would finish out their lives struggling physically, financially, and socially. Talk about disappointment. And this verse 7 really drops us into a tough place theologically. Because we want to believe, if you're honest with yourself, we all want to believe that God is somehow on board with the idea of karma. That if we do good for God, then he will turn around and do good for us. It's this idea that God is in some way a cosmic-sized vending machine, which I know you've been talking about for the last Uh, This idea of a vending machine, you've talked about it some over the last few weeks with prayer, but it's this idea that if you get the combination for life just right, then God will drop down the blessing that you want. You think about a vending machine, it it usually requires a two-button combination, a letter and a number. And if you get the right combination, then you will get what you want. And I think a lot of us want to believe that God's like that. If we, if we get the combination of life right, then we will get ultimately what we want. Well, if you look at Zachariah and Elizabeth, I would say that they got the combination right. They have verse 5 combined with verse 6. They have a good heritage combined with good character. You would think it would result in a verse 7 that is chocked full of blessing. But for Zachariah and Elizabeth, the vending machine of heaven has gotten jammed. And maybe you're here this morning and you can identify with that. Because when you look at your life, you might say, you know what, I feel like I've gotten the combination right. I have faith in God. And I've been studying his word and I've been seeking to live a life that's pleasing to him. And I seek to obey him so I have faith and I have good works. I have obedience. I feel like I've gotten the combination right. But instead of God dropping down blessing, it feels as if he has dropped down disappointment. And this is where you're at today, where your dreams and your reality are going in two totally different directions. Here's what you need to know. When you interact with God as if he's on board with karma, that if you do good, you can expect to get good, or if you interact with God as if he's a cosmic-sized vending machine and you work hard to get the combination just right, and in the end, instead of dropping down blessing, it feels like he drops down disappointment Life becomes disappointing, and when life becomes disappointing, God can become disappointing. And when God becomes disappointing, it can cause massive disruptions in your relationship with him. I remember one of my close friends growing up, graduated high school, went to college at Baylor. And while he was at Baylor, man, everything in life just imploded 
Uh, he had some extended family members who multiple family members died just in a period of a week. Um, his roommate at the time was killed in a plane crash. He was involved in a serious boating accident, and in, somewhere in the mix, he was diagnosed with cancer, all in a matter of a year. And as he was telling me his story, he said, you know what, I just got to this moment where I told God, you can throw whatever you want my way, and I will show you I can handle it on my own. And I really appreciate what he was saying, because I think he was just articulating what many of us might feel this morning. What was he saying? He was simply saying, what's the point? What's the point of faith? What's the point of Jesus? What's the point of all of this trying to put my trust in God? Because if I have had faith in him and I've sought to please him, but in the end, it doesn't end with blessing, it ends with disappointment. What is the point? And maybe that's where you're at. And maybe your relationship with God, it feels like it's just kind of hanging on by a thread this morning. My friend, he, he ended up taking a, a decade break from Jesus. And that decade was packed full of compromising decisions. And I look and I just say, you know what, it makes sense. It makes sense that that decade was full of compromising decisions because the reality is you need to know when there is a lot of disappointment in God, it also might be joined by a lot of sin against God. Because what we will do is we will seek to pacify our pain with things that just heap more pain into, onto the mix. The first key truth that you need to be clear on when you're dealing with disappointment in your life is this. If you interact with God as if he is a cosmic-sized vending machine, you need to know the vending machine of heaven will ultimately get jammed. It will it will ultimately get jammed. And I feel like the Bible has been really clear about this. I think about what Jesus told his friends in John 16, This is just hours before he's arrested and ultimately crucified, which means he is sharing with his friends some of the most important truths that he can. John 16, Jesus tells his friends this, I have told you these things so that in me you, you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. I just pictured Jesus, and I don't think that this necessarily happened, but I just pictured Jesus getting with his friends saying, hey, uh, guys, I'm God, so I know everything, but I went ahead and stayed up all night just thinking how I wanted to put this because I wanted it to be as clear as possible. Please don't miss this, guys. In this world, in this place that you currently live in, you will have trouble. Okay, Jesus, let me just make sure I'm clear on what you're saying, all right? What I hear you saying is that you are like a vending machine, and if I get the combination just right, you will give me what I want. No, in this world, you will, not you might, you will have trouble. Jesus spells it out for us. Why does Jesus say in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, come to me all who are weary and heavy laden and I will give you rest. He says that because this world, this life can be extremely difficult. You go and read the Psalms, why do the Psalms portray God as a rock and a refuge and a shelter and a, strong, a stronghold and a healer of the brokenhearted? Why? Because God never promises to stop the storms in life, but he does promise to sustain us in the midst of the storms. And those are two totally different views of God. The first key truth you need to know is that if you interact with God as a cosmic-sized vending machine, you need to know that that vending machine will ultimately get jammed. The second key truth that you need to know when dealing with disappointment is this. Just because you can't see God doing something doesn't mean God's not doing something. Do you hear that? Just because you can't see God doing something doesn't mean God's not doing something. Look at how the story continues. Verse 8. It 
It says this, Now while he was serving as priest before God when his division was on duty according to the custom of the priesthood, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. So here's what you need to know. At this point in time, there is somewhere between 18 and 20,000, 18,000 and 20,000 priests in Israel. That's far too many priests to all serve in the temple at the same time. And so these 18 to 20,000 priests were divided into 24 different divisions. And for one week, twice a year, each division would serve in the temple. So it is Zechariah's division's turn to serve in the temple. Once in the morning, once in the evening, one priest would be chosen to enter the holy place, burn incense, and offer prayers to God. And that chief was chosen, that, that priest was chosen by casting lots. And we don't have anything equivalent to casting lots in our society today, but I'll explain it in terms of rolling the dice. And if you were to be chosen as the priest who gets to enter into the holy place to burn incense and offer prayers, this was like a once-in-a-lifetime pinnacle of your career type opportunity. So year after year, Zachariah shows up, rolls the dice, nothing. Rolls the dice, nothing. This particular time, he shows up, rolls the dice, and his number gets called. And so Zachariah enters the holy place. And here's what happens, verse 10. And the whole multitude of the people were praying outside at the hour of incense. And there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And Zechariah was troubled when he saw him, and fear fell upon him. And so Zechariah's number gets called. He enters the holy place, and we know what he's doing. We know that he's burning incense, and he's praying. And we know what he's praying. We know that he is praying for uh, Israel's deliverance from oppression. But some commentators believe that in this moment, he even has a second prayer queued up, and it's a prayer for a child. And as he's praying, an angel shows up standing on the right side of the altar, which was a position of favor. And the angel comes with very good news, and we find it in verse 13. What does he say? It says, the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. Do you hear what the angel's saying? He's saying, Zechariah, just because you couldn't see God doing something doesn't mean God has not been doing something. There has never been a moment where you and Elizabeth have not been on God's radar. There has never been a moment where you have not been on his mind. There has never been a moment in your journey where God has not been with you. God has been leading you and Elizabeth through life to this moment where he is now going to show up and do the impossible. I'll tell you this, as the more I read the scriptures, the more it becomes clear that God does some of his best work in the most disappointing times. Do you realize that? God does some of his best work in the most disappointing times. I think about the Exodus, where God sends Moses in to bust two million people out of slavery. And so Moses goes in and says, hey, follow me to freedom. And so two million people begin to follow Moses, and Moses takes the people the way, the route that God tells them to go. And where do they find themselves? At a dead end. The Red Sea. Can you imagine this? Moses is like, here we go. We're on our way to freedom. Okay, uh, Moses, just to be clear, I thought you said freedom. Uh, this is a sea. This is a dead end. Can you imagine the disappointment? Imagine the conversations. And what does God do? He shows up and splits the sea in half. Imagine the people associated with, with Lazarus when Lazarus died. He dies, and the text is really clear in John 11 that Lazarus, Lazarus and his two sisters, Mary and Martha, are people that Jesus really cared about. But Lazarus dies, and Jesus doesn't even bother to show up for four days. And when Jesus finally rolls into town, what does Martha say to him? She in a sense says, where were you? Have you ever said that to God? Where were you? And she says, if you had been here, things would have been different. Maybe you felt that before. Imagine the disappointment. 
You know Jesus cares about you. Your brother dies. Jesus doesn't bother to show up for four days. Imagine the disappointment. But what does Jesus do? He tells him to roll away the stone. He begins to talk to a dead guy. And Lazarus comes back to life. Jesus does some of his best work in the, the most disappointing times. What does this mean? It means be patient. Trust God. Pray fervently. Ask God to move. What if God is just moving you to a place now in your life where you're going to get to see him move in greater ways than you would have ever gotten to see him move if your dreams in reality had been perfectly synced up? Some of y'all just need to be reminded this morning that God is the God of the impossible. He loves to do things that doctors can't explain. He loves to defy odds. He loves to provide miraculously. He loves to bless us at times and in ways that we would least expect it. So don't be surprised if God shows up and does the impossible in your life. At the same time, Remember, God's ways are not our ways, and his thoughts are not our thoughts, and there will be times where God does not heal or bless or answer in the way that we want him to. But it might be that God's greatest movement in our lives come, his greatest movement comes in the form of an inner peace or an unexplainable joy in the midst of our disappointment. And that leads me to my third point. The third key truth that you need to know when dealing with disappointment in your life is this. God cares deeply about your joy. God cares deeply about your joy. Look back at verse 14, what the angel says to Zechariah. He says this. You will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. And so the angel is just basically unpacking God's will for Zechariah and Elizabeth's life. So he says, okay, point one on God's will for your life, Zechariah, your old wrinkly wife, is going to get pregnant, all right? And that's kind of a good deal. Uh, Point number two on God's will for your life, you're going to have joy. Why? Because God cares deeply about your joy. God has always cared about your joy. Will you believe that this morning? That right where you are this morning, whatever season of disappointment you're in right now, God cares deeply about your joy. It it is his desire for you to be full of joy. The reason I can confidently say that is because the scriptures, that is what the scriptures convey to us. If you were to go spend time reading this book, you would see that God cares deeply about two things. Number one, he cares deeply about his glory. And number two, he cares deeply about your joy. And the good news is that these two things are not mutually exclusive. They go hand in hand. When there's an increase in God's glory in your life, there is always an increase in your joy. But I want you to see just how clearly the scriptures communicate that God is passionate about our joy. John chapter 15, Jesus is explaining to his friends the key to life. He says the key to life is to abide in Christ. And as he walks them through this, this, these key truths, he ends by saying this, these things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. Romans 15, 13 says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy in peace and believing, so, be, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. What's the second fruit of the Spirit? Well, there's love and then there's what? Joy. And we're to be full of the Holy Spirit. James 1, 2 through 3 says this, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. God cares deeply about your joy. I want you to know that this message this morning is, is, is really a personal message. Uh, my wife and I have just recently turned the corner from a disappointing season in life. Uh, in December, we found out that we were pregnant. In January, we went into the doctor and we saw a great sonogram, healthy baby, strong heartbeat, and then we went into the doctor in February and found out that our baby no longer had, no longer had a heartbeat. And uh, man, talk about a disappointing moment for us. It, it, it's just because we had started planning. We had told our two boys that they were going to have a little 
baby in the mix. We had begun to tell family and friends. And so we had just begun to plan for the family expansion. And so our dreams in reality really did go in two totally different directions when we got that news. And let me just say this real quick, okay? I am fully aware that there are far deeper amounts of disappointment in this room than our miscarriage. But what I am trying to tell you is that the disappointment that we experienced, it was real. And so I get what we are talking about this morning. But I'll tell you, I look back on this season of disappointment and I can confidently say that God cares deeply about our joy. And I could see that throughout the process of our disappointment, God was all about our joy. I think about uh, the day that we found out that our baby no longer had a heartbeat. I wasn't even planning on being at the appointment. Uh, I usually don't miss a sonogram, but this sonogram was just going to be an extra measuring, and so um, I didn't feel like I needed to be there. I had made uh, breakfast plans, and I finished my breakfast, and uh, I was uh, I was heading home, and so I called Kat, thinking that the appointment was already over, and she said, well, I'm just sitting here, I'm, I'm just sitting here in the room waiting on the doctor, and I just happened to be driving right by the hospital. So I said, you know what, I'll come sit with you. And I looked like an awesome husband, because it was like, hey, I just want to be with you. I'll just come sit with you, babe. She was like, okay. And so um, I pull into the parking lot, and I'm uh, as I pull in, she texts me and says, hey, the doctor just walked in. And so I'm Forrest Gump sprinting through the parking lot and up the stairs. And right as I walk in, right when I walk into the room, the doctor says, I have bad news. There's no heartbeat. And I look back on that moment, and I just sense God saying, yes, life is about to get really disappointing, but at the same time, you're going to experience my joy because you didn't even know where you needed to be this morning, but I knew exactly where you needed to be. You needed to be in that room with your wife hearing that news. And then a couple days later, as we were worshiping, we were singing that song, You're a Good, Good Father, and in the midst of that song, I just sensed God whispering into my life, I love you, and I am with you. And we, you know, a lot of people don't share about their miscarriage, and I, I think that that's a tragedy just because when it, it, it's never good to hurt alone. And so we shared with some key people, and we just experienced the joy that comes when the body of Christ comes around people who are hurting in any capacity. And people reached out to us and loved on us and prayed for us and even made meals for us. And just because of how things played out, and this is really sharing too much, but I guess I'll just say what Ken said, I said at Breakaway, we may never see each other again, so what, why not? Just the way things played out. It just wasn't a, an easy process. We had to go to the doctor two more times and see the same thing that we had already seen, which was two more disappointing sonograms of the same reality, which led to my wife having to have surgery. And just even... Just being at the hospital, watching my wife get wheeled away to sur surgery, just a minor operation, but just in that moment, God using that moment for me to be reminded how deep my love for my wife goes. And even in the midst of this disappointment, for God to be just shoveling joy into our lives. And so the reason that I even share this with you is in no way to tweak your emotions for us. It's to say, I get it, and what I am telling you this morning is true. That God cares deeply about our joy. You know what? Great amounts of joy come when God allows your dreams and your reality to be perfectly synced up. But you also need to know some of the greatest amounts of joy come when God ministers to you in the midst of the disappointment that comes from your dreams and reality going in two totally different directions. So don't miss the joy that is waiting for you today. Don't sit there and wait for your disappointment to turn the corner because that's where joy will be. Now what if God wants to do something in your life? What if he wants to flood your life with joy today even in the midst of the disappointment. The fourth key truth that I want you to know uh, when dealing with disappointment in your life is this. God's plan A for your life is better than your plan A for your life. 
God's plan A for your life is so much better than your plan A for your life. Look back at the text. Look, look at verses 14 and 15. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great before the Lord, and he must not drink wine or strong drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. And so the angel shows up and says, hey, this is going to be a special kid because your kid is going to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Here's why that's such a big deal. Okay, the period of time between the Old Testament and the New Testament is considered the intertestamental period. And it was considered uh, 400 years of silence where the nation of Israel really heard nothing new from God and the presence of the Holy Spirit wasn't felt. And so the angel shows up and says, hey, your kid is going to be full of the Holy Spirit. It's as if the angel is saying, hey, the Holy Spirit is going to go public again with your child. And the nation of Israel hasn't heard a prophetic word in 400 years. The last thing that they had really heard was back At the end of Malachi, let me just read you what Malachi chapter 4 verses 5 and 6 say. It it says, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes, and he will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction." 400 years later, Gabriel shows up to Zechariah and listen to, Ze- listen to Gabriel's wording. Verses 16 and 17. And you will turn, and he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. And he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. So do you see what's happening here? The angel comes to Zechariah and he's basically saying, hey, you know that one that Malachi talked about? The one who would turn hearts back to the Lord? The one who would prepare the way for the Messiah? Yeah, he's going to call you daddy. So yeah, you, um, your plan A for your life uh, culminated in you and Elizabeth having a baby that would change your lives. Well, my plan A, God's plan A for your lives is going to culminate in you having a kid that's going to change countless lives. Your plan A culminated in having a baby. God's plan A culminates in you getting a John the Baptist, all right? God's plan A is better than your plan A. God's dreams are so much better than your dreams. Just think about it. With God, who knows what will happen tomorrow? Really, who knows what will happen tomorrow? Just because you're disappointed today in your unfulfilled dreams doesn't mean you won't be rejoicing tomorrow in God's dreams to change the world through you. So what would it look like for you today just to come before God and be honest and say, God, life is disappointing. My dreams, my reality have gone in two totally different directions and it has landed me in the season of disappointment and because life is disappointing, you have become disappointing to me. But this morning, I'm going to begin to believe that just because I can't see you doing something doesn't mean you're not doing something. And I'm going to begin to believe that you really do care about my joy. And I'm going to claim the fact that your plan A is better than my plan A. So God, I trust you. And I'm asking you to show up in my life. I want you to see how the story finishes up. Look at verses 18 through 25. It says this. I love what Zechariah says here. He says to the angel, how shall I know this? For I'm an old man and my wife is advanced in years. Guys, did you see what he did there? He's like, well, I'm old and my wife, uh, well, she's advanced. um, So that's good. (laughs) Underline that, man. He says, how shall I know this? And the angel responds, "Uh, hello, McFly. Um, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I was sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. And behold, you're going to be silent and unable to speak until the day that these things take place, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time. And the people were waiting for Zechariah, and they were wondering at his delay in the temple. And when he came out, he was unable to speak to them, and they realized that he had seen a vision in the temple. And he kept making signs to them and remained mute. And when his time of service was ended, he went to his home. After these days, his wife Elizabeth conceived, and for five months she kept herself hidden 
saying, Thus the Lord has done for me in the days when he looked on me to take away my reproach among people. So just get what's happening here. Four years, Zachariah and Elizabeth have prayed for a kid. And then the angel shows up and says, you're going to get your kid. And what does Zachariah do? He doubts. He doubts. And I'm so, I, I mean, I hate to say it, but I'm kind of encouraged by this. Because what this shows me is that this story isn't about Zechariah or Elizabeth's faithfulness. That's not what this story is about. This isn't a story about their faithfulness. This is a story about God's faithfulness. That even in the midst of their doubt, God shows up. Even in the midst of their doubt, God shows up. You know what, praise God that he isn't on board with karma, this idea of if you do good, you'll get good. Praise God that he's not on board with some cosmic-sized vending machine where if you get the combination just right, you'll get what you want. Because the bottom line is this, God's definition of good is different than our definition of good. God's definition of good is perfection. And if God's definition of good is perfection, that means that the combination of life is impossible. It's impossible for anyone to get right. Nobody here is capable of getting the combination of life just right to get what you want from God. Now, the reality is every single one of us falls short of God's standard of perfection. Imperfect people before a perfect God don't deserve blessing. We actually deserve punishment. So the good news of Christianity is that God, just like he did with Zachariah and Elizabeth, God blesses us in spite of us. And so this morning, if you're sitting in the midst of a disappointing season, if life is disappointing because life is disappointing, God has become disappointing, the place where you need to start today is with realizing that you don't necessarily deserve what you think you deserve from God. No, every single one of us is deserving of punishment, not blessing but God being rich in mercy has lavished us with his grace. And instead of dropping down punishment, he dropped down his son, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ lived the life that we couldn't. He is the only one who's ever lived a perfect life. And then Jesus died the death that every single one of us deserved to die. Jesus Christ went went to the cross and he was punished on the cross for our sins. And on the third day, Jesus Christ was raised from the dead so that all who put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ could be raised to walk in newness of life. This is the good news of Christianity, that God blesses us in spite of us. And when you have faith in Jesus Christ, when you come to a moment where you open up your life, you open up your heart, you invite Jesus Christ in, when you know Jesus Christ in a personal way, now, even in the midst of disappointment, you can be confident that God is with you. God is leading you. God is caring for you. God is crying with you. God is working all things for good on behalf of you. And then one day is coming where he is going to take you to in an eternity free from disappointment. This is our reality when we are in Christ. If your dreams and your reality are going in two totally different directions and you are in the midst of a disappointing season, you need to know the only answer for your disappointment is Jesus Christ. And so let me just ask you, do you know him? Do you know Jesus Christ? Are you looking to him? Will you trust him? Because he can be trusted when your dreams and your reality go in two totally different directions and you find yourself in a season of disappointment. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, I just pray for every person in this room right now dealing with disappointment, God. 
And I would imagine that the disappointment can run pretty deep in this room. And I thank you that you care, God. I thank you that you care deeply. I thank you that just because we can't see you doing something doesn't mean you're not doing something. Thank you that you do care deeply about every single person's joy. Thank you that your plan A is better than our plan A. Your dreams are, are better than our dreams, God. And so I pray, God, for every single person in here in the midst of disappointment, God, that they would realize that there is joy waiting for them now. It's not some future date when they can finally turn the corner on this season. It's here and now, God. So we praise you, Jesus, for who you are and, and what you've done. And we praise you that even in the midst of the disappointment, you're with us, caring for us. And I praise you that a day is coming where you're going to put a stop to all of the disappointment. And we will have an eternity with you. Satisfied and full of joy. We need you. We love you. Amen. Welcome to Postscript. Here we hope to answer your questions and help you dig deeper into the messages and sermons at FaithBridge by talking with the teacher of the day. Hey, welcome to Postscript. My name is Hannah Connor and I'm on the worship and communications team here. And we're here with Timothy Atik, our TA. He's just preached an awesome sermon on dealing with disappointment. And uh, so we have some questions Great. to go over. Awesome. Well, the first question we have um, is, are the disappointments that I've experienced in my life part of God's plan A for me? Yeah, I would say that, you know, I think about what David says in Psalm 139, that all the days of life have been written before there was even one. That no disappointment that comes in your life ever catches God off guard. God is never scrambling with your life. Somehow God is never the originator of any evil, yet he somehow is able to use it all to work together to, to, to bring about beauty in your life. And it's always his will for your life is good, pleasing, and perfect, if that makes sense. So I always view it as and I've used that here at Faith Bridge before, but I always view it as a big mosaic that it's made up of different scenes and all we can see is the one disappointing scene in our life, but mm -hmm. somehow God is able to take all the scenes where everything is as it should be and all the scenes where nothing is as it should be and He's able to work it all together for something that is beautiful and perfect according to His plan. Great, that's helpful. Yeah. Um, what do we do when a disappointing season turns into depression? Yeah, and I would say that, you know, disappointment can turn into depression. Depression can be the cause of the disappointment. I think it's really just how do we deal with depression in any aspect of our lives? And, um, and I would just say that um, one of the best things you can do when, when you are dealing with depression is you need to know that you you should not try and deal with it on your own. You always need outside help. And so part of it, I would always, I always push people towards counseling because the scriptures are clear that we need counseling. That's why the Holy Spirit is called the counselor mm -hmm. because we need counseling. So I think that that's a great reality. Don't ever be scared to go to counseling because we all need it. But even more than that, if you're just feeling down, maybe it's it, it's nothing clinical, but it's just you're you're going through a season where you're feeling down. You know, we we all need people, good community in our lives that can walk alongside us, speak truth into our lives, and remind us of of truth. I think depression comes a lot of times, or just feelings of being down come when we buy into lies or a negative mentality, and so we need people around us who can just remind us of the truth, okay? But especially if things become more severe, you need to get into to counseling to, to help process through that. That's great advice. I think that um, it can also be scary to hope again after a disappointment. Uh, how do you suggest that we deal with that fear 
that comes when we're trying to trust God after a disappointment. Yeah. Well, I think that, um, you know, it, it really comes down to who you believe God to be. Because if, if, if the scriptures are true, then God is good. No matter what, His goodness isn't contingent upon what He gives you. He's, he's good regardless. And so, you know, you have to answer the question, whose hands is your life best in? Is, is your life best in your hands or in God's hands? Well, okay, you're on a, you, you're on a planet with seven billion sinful people. Okay, and you have no control. Whether you realize it or not, you have no control over your life. So you can either try and go through your life having control, trying to work everything out, which isn't going to go well for you, or you can put your trust in the one who is sovereign and in control of all things and is completely good. And there still might be disappointment in that, but I promise you your life's going to be better in his hands than in your own Hands. And so I think it always comes back to the character of God. Who do you believe him to be? Because if he is good, no matter what he gives you or doesn't give you, then you can trust him. And your trust in him isn't contingent upon what he gives you. I love what my friend Greg Mott says. He's a pastor here in Houston, but he just said, you know, based on what Christ has done for us on the cross, even if God never gave us another thing, he's already given us too much. So just that right there is, is enough to say, okay, I can trust him. That's awesome. Yeah. Thank you for the awesome message and for sitting down with us. And we hope you'll join us again next week for Postscript. Thanks for joining us for Postscript. Help us keep the podcast interactive by submitting your questions during the morning services. Learn more at faithbridge.org postscript.